Uh, all right, good afternoon. Um, great to see you uh, here in Warsawa, beautiful place. Um, I will talk about uh, data pipelines in uh, quite broadly about many different uh, kinds of data pipelines. So I'm here uh, representing partially um, from Baylor College of Medicine. There are two universities. There is Baylor University, there is Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, so, um, and um, uh, also from Data Joint Neuro, uh, the company we have, uh, we started about two years ago uh, helping uh, neuroscience labs and multi-lab collaboratives um, build data pipelines. So just for context, one project that we have been involved in that shows the, some of the challenges of running uh, large uh, distributed multi-investigator, uh, multi-modality um, type of experiment. This, is, uh, this project is called MICRONS, uh, standing for Machine Intelligence from Cortical no Networks, and part of it involves um, three groups uh, working at Baylor College of Medicine, acquiring two photon uh, calcium data from mice, very detailed, a full cubic millimeter using two photon and three photon imaging. Um, every, every neuron in a full cubic millimeter is fully um, characterized in terms of its visual response properties. Then the same animal goes to the Allen Institute where electron microscopy is conducted and that volume is completely imaged every detail, every vesicle, every membrane. And then uh, the data goes to uh, the Soong Lab at Pr uh, Princeton University where the data, uh, the anatomy data are segmented and then the entire data set is brought together where we know each cell, you know, know its anatomy, know what it did when the animal was still looking at pictures. Um, so just to give the, some of the challenge, challenges. One is complexity. So. Uh, the mouse is uh, imaged multiple times, multiple sessions. In each session, about 20,000 uh, 20, cells are recorded, uh, and then over multiple days, the full volume, in one cubic millimeter, you have about 100,000 neurons. So, and, and after you show all the movies, you end up with about one million neuron hours from one animal. And then, um, this is not the only thing that's done, the animal is also behaving. It's whisking, it's moving its eyes, it's running. Um, it views images, and um, so all, the, all of these modalities are combined. And then, um, so there is a lot of data. Data quality is, uh, is affected by many factors. The animal is there, it's not, it, it's not trying to get a nature paper out. It's just really um, living its life. And so it can fall asleep, it can do think it's, it's not necessarily doing what you ask it to do. And if you are recording for hours and hours, uh, keeping track of the state of the animal from a lot of physiological and, and from um, behavioral readouts, just, you know, if, if the eyes are closed, obviously the data are not good. Um, and then, uh, so a lot of, as algorithms are designed, for example, for segmentation, uh, for image segmentation, they're designed in a little sandbox with one, one single data set. But in real life, when you have to deal with many different aspects, you have to control your entire pipeline very precisely so that you, you have all the controls to rule out the bad data to, to make it work. Um, so again, you image very large, so this is an, another recent, um, it was on bio, posted on BioArchive from our lab. Um, uh, just if you, uh, with the complexity and with the size, you, you find new patterns that you couldn't see before simply because sometimes, sometimes more is not just more, it's different. And then uh, you need to have extreme flexibility. So this is a fraction of the data pipeline. And, uh, and so data pipelines don't stay fixed. We continually uh, try, to, we continually, continually, uh, continually improve different uh, phases, so we may like to improve motion correction or, or segmentation, and, and then the entire pipeline needs to re redo its work. So this is, uh, for example, the spike finder challenge uh, fairly recently, last year, ran a competition of different spike, um, ca uh, calcium spike detection algorithms. And so we, uh, we want to uh, work efficiently so we can do new kinds of experiments that we cannot afford to wait for days for data reprocess to re get reanalyzed. So in this, in this paper, 
uh, it's called the inception loop. Um, the, the approach is where uh, inference is made, inference about brain function is made in the following way. The activity of the brain in response to stimuli is recorded on day one. And then the neural network is, ne is trained to predict the output of, of the brain. And then uh, on day two, or overnight, the, uh, the network is then used to, gen to generate images, new types of stimuli by running the, the network backwards to, to figure out some test images, some test stimuli that will prove that, that we understood something about the brain. So some of them are called maximum, maximally exciting images, basically using the neural network to produce the image that we predict will be most exciting to the uh, nervous system. So to, be, to do this, you have to be very efficient. You have to make sure that as you run experiments, and we run, run many of them per day, then all the data are processed and ready to go for the next experiment in the, day, in the following day. So that's the context. So what do we need to do to do this? Uh, to do this? We talk about data sharing. There are different kinds of uh, data sharing. The uh, types of data sharing and the FAIR principle primarily talks about this type of data sharing at the end. When the study is done, you package your data set, you share it. Uh, uh-oh, I clicked something. Okay, and so, um, okay, back. Um, so the data sharing I, I want to talk about is the data pipeline sharing. So live data, not uh, data sets, but data pipelines. Live, um, live evolving data as people are working together at the same time. So for that, you don't just, fear is just, um, it's just the, the tip of the iceberg. Things like um, concurrent access and just efficiency of, of searches, and so the data need to be indexed for efficient search. Data integrity and consistency, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Speed, precise queries, so because these are distributed teams, they need to access just the data they need, so you don't have to send the data sets around. So you can get just the, the piece of information that you need. So for that, we, ha we have a framework called Data Joint that supports data pipeline. This is specifically the tool for, uh, general tool for creating computational, shared computational data pipelines for, for uh, it's quite general, but we happen to use it for neuroscience data pipelines. And then to Data Joint, you connect, can connect a lot of interfaces and applications. So again, we're working with computational relational databases where basically what that means, we combine a schema, basically rules of data integrity with computation as part of the model and workflow. The main advantage of data joint and the main kind of the, the claim, to, claim to a significance here is that we can take students who are not computer scientists and kind of we reduce down the, to the principles that we can teach uh, students and postdocs to become database programmers and database uh, experts for computation. So basically, um, if you know any, uh, about relational databases, data are represented as tables, and it, each table is not just a spreadsheet. Each table has a specific meaning. It corresponds to some, some thing in your, um, in your experiment. For example, one table might be, might be called mouse, and it contains mice. The next could be a session, which is a recording session, a neuron, and there could be a, a spike detection parameters or algorithms that produce spikes in, in activity statistics, th things of that nature. So data integrity is something that, so a lot of neuroscientists work with data as data repositories or data collections, but not with databases. And, and concepts of data integrity are not familiar. Um, and, and I know we mentioned some of them, like identification. So some of these, um, some of these concepts need to be taught and, and institutionalized. For example, entity integrity is just the guarantee that what you represent corresponds to what's in the real world, and that, that representation rem remains unique so that when you work together and you, you go to a specific mouse and you update something about it, you updated the, the right animal and the right, and everybody sees this. So referential integrity, compositional integrity, these are an inherent part of the, of the process. So if you know relational databases in the, in the common kind of talk, people think relational means SQL. Uh, there is no SQL involved in data joint, and in fact, SQL was intended to be a simple language, but it turns out to be very complex because it doesn't make very, um, it, by just, it turns out that 
by making a few simple assumptions, you can significantly uh, simplify and create a language that um, to, to um, interact with data that is much more conceptually clarified. This is just an example. If you have done any databases, there is like kind of a hello world example. In databases, it's a university registration database. This is just an example from, from that world. And you can see that with data joint, a query like give me all the currently enrolled students would be student and enroll and current term. In SQL, you would have to learn how to write these types of queries. And it takes a semester to learn usually, but uh, with data joint, we can teach students who are neuroscientists as part of their job to work efficiently with shared, shared structured data. So each, each node is represented as a Python class or a MATLAB class interchangeably, so that you can work from MATLAB and Python. And you can define computational, so the data structure is the first, that, that's the definition that defines how this node fits into the pipeline. And then the make is what, what computation that node performs. It just fetches data from above in the pipeline, performs the computation, and inserts the result, result into itself. So that's basically what it is. Data joint is a language for programming databases and computation. Uh, the architecture underneath, it's a relational database. We use MySQL for the most part, plus to store the bulk data, a file system or S3 with Amazon or its um, compatible services like Minio, for example, is a great program that you can install on-premises that will act as S3 and works uh, amazingly. So um, yeah, so and then as, as so we, I came up, I wrote the first version of data joint for my own experiments about 10 years ago, it spread through the lab, then it spread to other labs, and then with microns, people started hearing about it, so we, we started a company to, to help uh, labs if they need any extra. Everything is open source and free, and a lot of labs have adopted it, but some, some uh, uh, specifically multi-lab collaborations often need support. So we started the company, now we have this group, and so we, need, we have also some software engineers and data engineers and IT, IT engineers to help with some of these more demanding projects. So these are the labs that we know currently be, to be using data joint, but we don't know all of them because it's just a free open source tool. And so some the ones that are highlighted are the ones we work directly either in blue as an academic collaboration from Baylor College of Medicine or in green as um, contra uh, contracts. So um, this type of approach allows separation of labor where, where kind of the data engineering is hidden. You, you deal with a more high level representation of your data pipeline is this uh, logical structure with computations defined for them. And then the, all the parallel computing, all the things that need to happen to make it efficient happen in the background set up by the people who know how to do it. So this is kind of the separation of mindset. The scientist deals with the conceptual questions, the data scientist who creates the, the logic of the experiment, the logic of the data pipeline, the logic of computations and statistical tests, but does not need to know how the cloud works or how, the, how, how to convert and migrate data. So one example, um, one, some large projects evolve into a large project, but some projects now are put together. So, so the International Brain Lab is a great example that um, where 21 leading labs were put together to work on a common problem. and, and uh, and uh, needed to set up an effective common data infrastructure. And so, so our, our team joined the project to, to help and become that bridge. So this is just a fragment from their pipeline. Theirs is open source, you can see it. Uh, this GitHub link, or if you just Google in the International Brain Lab. Um, several other similar uh, projects of similar scale are currently in progress. And so one of them is, for, as an example, is the, called the Mesoscale Activity Map. It's uh, funded by the Simons Foundation and is between four labs, uh, uh, BCM, Genelia Farm, um, Stanford, and NYU. And um, so we, we, uh, the data scientists define the data pipeline. We set up a uh, Amazon Cloud pipeline for them, but, but they define the logic of the pipeline. They define the computations and run them. And then uh, the Argonne uh, National Laboratory provided 
massive storage so uh, to store shared data in accessible to everybody. This is, um, this is uh, my um, uh, summary. We have um, djneuro.io is the, uh, the company website. Um, I will be uh, running a demo here. We have a little booth we can, we can show. Um, but yeah, a lot of great things are happening. This, this is, um, uh, this is a, a great time to be a, both a data scientist and a neuro neuroscientist and ideally both. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, questions? Rick? Getting my exercise today. Uh, suppose uh, in, instead of coming maybe from raw SQL, someone's coming from another or um, like, let's say I, I, I've used Django. And so I have a Django developer, and I, I uh, what, what would I be looking forward to in, 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 in data journey? I can imagine one thing might be uh, you've thought about the, the quantities and volumes of, of large-scale data that obviously someone just running a web, normal web server wouldn't have, and so maybe Django wouldn't be a good, uh, the Django ORM wouldn't be optimized for. But I imagine you might have some other thoughts on, on that as well, about what are some advantages of data joint, if you'd like to share those. Um, that's right. So there, there are family of concepts, programs called, uh, or libraries called uh, ORM, Subject Relational Mappings. Um, and the idea is that, um, there, uh, is that programmers are used to, to work more with objects and the object model, which usually has an object with its properties and you access them that way. D a relational database work very, very differently. In a relational database, uh, the idea of a relational database is that you work with data is with sets. You don't iterate through sets, you have set operations. Whereas in the object model, usually you, you iterate through uh, some properties and then links and follow them. And so there's kind of a mismatch. And uh, between, so it's actually called the, the object relational impedance um, mismatch. And, uh, and so a lot of people have tried to kind of patch that. Um, DataJune does not make that trade off, it is fully relational. So you work with data as sets, and there is no that, that mapping doesn't it. So, so the operations are fully relational, things like joins and, and um, so basically to, um, and I'll show you in some examples, but basically when you work, uh, a query will look, um, so you basically don't tinkle with the, with the properties, you, you work with data much more on, the level, on, on a much higher level of abstraction than, than you would be with uh, Django, for example. So, so Django is more specifically designed for web design rather than working with scientific data. So we work with scientific data, so one thing that we da databases are not very good with um, by themselves, uh, so data joint helps solve that, is work with scientific data like arrays, massive, uh, 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 and so um, numerical arrays, uh, bulk data, and so we had to put a lot of features there to, to make it seamless. So then when you fetch data, it comes back as a NumPy array. So we never, working with data joint, you never work with file, there's no concept files, there's no uh, concept of file formats or anything of that. You, when you fetch data by specific criterion, you get a numerical array in MATLAB or Python that contains the data, exactly the data that you ask for. And, and because of the flexible query language, you can, you can get data in different combinations that are specific to your analysis. So you can say, you know, give me all the tuned cells from these three animals that have this genetic marker and you don't have to get the entire data set, you just get that, th those pieces of data in one, say, structure array or array of dictionaries in, in uh, Python. Was that a, <laughs> okay. Any further questions specifically? Uh, yes, and I'd already like to ask uh, the other two speakers maybe to quickly come in front. We are a bit behind schedule, but I think we have maybe time for a few concluding words instead of the panel discussion. In this project, you also, so you have a client which exports data in NWB format, right? So probably in many. Oh, this is, this is more like pl planned. Yeah, we have, uh, yeah, we have clients to export. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. So yeah. this is work in progress. Work in progress, but we have good demos for this. Yeah. But so this is, so NWB with the way we work with it is primarily as a kind of the output of the pipeline. In the pipeline itself, P 
people work with the database. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then just for the final kind of, we, call, we sometimes refer to that as the golden record kind of, once you're done with your project, or once as you're done with a part of the project, you want to package a data set for people to analyze that. But do you see a lot or sufficient amount of commonality between projects where you know you could provide some unification or harmonization on how you know even within the NWB, like custom classes and all that? Yeah. Like? So NWB, we're in uh, data join solve very different orthogonal problems, and we work with NWB. On, in teams, so we work with a lot of teams that are, some of them use NWB, some don't. And for those who do, uh, for example, we recently were completing a project with Lauren Frank's lab at UCSF, who uses NWB for high performance computing because they have recordings, selective physiology recordings that go on for days. So they have, they need to be able to index into a, arrays and just select parts. This is something that they have already developed. And so, and they also adopted data joint for their uh, data management because it has all the search capabilities, all the queries. So they want to have both. So we work with them and we had a little, little project to, to integrate the two processes. So when they fetch data and data from data joint, they get an object that is actually capable of indexing into an NWB file. And that's also transparent. So there's, when, when users work with it, they don't need to open files. They just get an NWB object back out of a data joint query and then just can work with it right in memory. And that's also open source. That's also open source, yes. Cool. So that's coming out. That's actually right now is getting tested. So that's for his lab.